Good morning, everyone. We will begin the session in about one minute. We're going to give everyone a few minutes to get logged in here. Thank you. Okay, let's get started. Good morning and welcome to the Spotlight webinar, Automatically Generated PFMEA. I am Lisa Sterling, your host and moderator for today's session. Before we get started though, I would like to mention just a couple of housekeeping items. We do invite you to ask questions throughout the presentation by typing in your Q&A tab or your chat at the bottom of your screen as your phone is muted during the session. We will address the questions received at the end of the presentation. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be available in a few days for playback. I would now like to introduce you to our presenter for today, Tim Hogan, Vice President of Business Development for HiQA. And with that, I will turn the floor over to Tim. All right, well, thank you very much, Lisa. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, it's, it's difficult to take time out of your day for a webinar, so we try to keep these small and try to keep them succinct and give you a lot of information in a short amount of time. And uh, that's certainly what we're trying to do today. Um, so again, thank you for joining. Um, but what do we do as a company? Um, quite frankly, we save time uh, because there's been so much emphasis been put on uh, manufacturing and getting parts done you know, better and faster and quicker so we can ship them out and that's that's great, it's a good thing. However, um, not as much emphasis has been put on the quality documentation side because we still need to get the parts measured, we still need to get the parts um, or, or the data from the measurements into some type of format and submission to be able to send to the customer. And that's what we focus on is streamlining that quality process. And this is essentially how we're going to do it. Uh, we focus on, well, let me back up for a second. So what do we really focus on? What we focus on is the submission for um, a customer to, or for our customer <laughs> to their customer, right? So we, we package that all together. And when we looked at the overall system, we had to back up and come to a starting point. And what is that starting point? We found that it was actually in the ballooning um, because uh, uh, our customers would get um, a 2D PDF from their customer, right? A print um, along with an order that says here, make this part. So that was almost the inception that we started at. So we brought in some tools to automatically balloon this, um, those 2D prints, extract the information off of it. And then from there, we can start building inspection plans and assigning uh, sampling rates and assigning gauge categories and even criticality like CTQs, KPCs, um, flight safety, all of that information. So we have all of that together because what we can do at that point, and I bring that up for a reason. I bring that up because we can use the information that we have in the planning phase to automatically generate our information um, in our uh, reporting phase. So all that information is actually captured together and synchronized. And you'll see that in a minute as we get going here. But then we make the parts and really can't stress this enough. A lot of our customers see extraordinary time-saving gains in the planning phase of it. And that's great. And that's what it's designed for. However, where you see some exponential uh, time savings is when we get into that production phase because um, all of the data is in one centralized location and now we can do something or you'd be able to do something with it, whether it's track statistics, 
create an FAI. Now, whether that FAI is a standalone or part of a larger submission package, you'll see kind of as we unpack this, how it all kind of ties together. But we definitely do want to focus on the APQP and PPAP portion of it, specifically the PFMEA and how we can automatically generate that PFMEA from information. Um, but it's all tied together in one synchronized location. And on the, four, on the 18 elements, we do get a lot of questions um, <laughs> about why we call it PQP and not APQP. And it's simply because we focus on the production side of the equation with all of the inputs and the data and the forms. Um, however, there are elements of the product that don't necessarily relate to the, to the production of it. Most do, but some don't. So we really focus on the production side, which is why we call it PQP. And now this will be a high level of the um, PFMEA um, uh, overview and how we uh, develop those and generate those. Uh, we're not going to get into the weeds too much on a lot of the details. Um, however, we do start with the manufacturing operations side, so we will be talking about that a little bit um, and then getting into the uh, APQP documentation, specifically the PFMEA generation and how we go about that and how it can uh, streamline your process. But we can never get very far in a presentation without talking about one of our key advantages, and quite frankly, that's the database. So um, we have, oh, by the way, we have both customers and uh, soon to be customers on this call. Um, so you'll hear me kind of go back and forth a little bit about this would relate to you, this would relate to you, um, it, but that's a, certainly a positive thing. But for those soon to be customers, just be aware that everything that we do is in a database. So it's the, one of the advantages of the database is real time information. Um, as we're pulling that data in, as we're ballooning it, as we're collecting data from the shop floor, as we get it from um, a uh, CMM or something like that, and as we're generating those, um, the submission information like the um, PFMEA, all that information is available real time to anyone in the system. And as many people can be logged in the system as you would like. Um, so let's talk about automating your uh, PFMEA and what that really looks like. Um, so a lot of people are very familiar with Steve Jobs and uh, this quote, Apple's been incredible at providing products and software that customers need and want, but they didn't necessarily know how to ask for it. So why do we bring this up? Because when we ask people and our customers how they needed um, their PFMEAs generated or how they um, work their APQP process, they said, oh, we need a better way to simply manage our documents. But we looked at it from a little different aspect and the engineers in high QA thought, why do we need documents? Let's, the content of the documents, we're gonna digitize that and now put it in a database. So there's no save as any longer. There's no grab a template and change it. Um, there's no 100 tab spreadsheets any longer and um, there's no files any longer. Um, so after we get all that information together and it's digitized, you can build them into package templates. Now the um, process flow, that, or, or I'm so sorry, the PFMEA that we're going to be focusing on today uh, when we get into the product is one of those components of the submission that we're going for. Um, so as we build this information, it's automatically generated and you'll see that as we go. The index there. Um, now, please don't think you have to kind of generate all this stuff yourself. Um, you, a lot of the information that you'll see in the database as we as we get into what's called the library, um, it is pre-populated for you. So there's a lot of information that is there in the background. Um, so it's not going to be too overwhelming for you. But also did just wanna bring up um, as the last point before we jump right into the software, our automated workflows. Now this is very, very important as we go from a paper-based system to a fully digital system. Because when you go to a digital system, you also have to have approval levels. And actually for a lot of a larger customers, 
Um, a lot of times, uh, maybe a purchase order or a requisition system, those are digital, right? It gets submitted to someone and then it bumps to the, other, to the next level for their approval. And this works much the same way, but we've incorporated it into the um, PFMEA and PPAP process to where um, all the submission information is, uh, uh, needs to go through its own workflow and work steps for approval. And all this information is captured together in the database and available um, in the history. So you have full traceability on all the workflows and the submission levels that, um, that it goes through. So, okay, that was uh, just a very brief introduction. Again, for a lot of customers on the call, we do have a lot of soon to be customers. So I wanted to kind of outline that. Um, for this, uh, we're going to kind of work a little bit backwards, actually. We're going to start by explaining the whole PQP side, and then we're going to go back and kind of develop some information. So, and, and you'll kind of understand what I mean as we kind of get into this a little bit more. So what I did is I opened up a file that already has some PQP information to it because we want to explain how we generate this information, how we generate these PFMEAs. Okay, so um, yes, one of our claims of fame is our ballooning technology. Uh, we single click balloon this um, and it automatically populated this. And additionally, we extracted this information off of the bill of care in, excuse me, put it into the bill of characteristics. You can see bill of characteristics right there. Um, so all of that was done automatically. And this print, if I don't remember exactly, actually I could probably find it right here, but um, maybe 30 seconds or so that it took to completely balloon this and then extract all of that information, okay? And we can do different things. Now I know that's generic, I'm sorry about that, but we can assign different rules, different categories, different information as we progress along here. So one of the aspects we do definitely wanna talk about because again, this paints the picture of how the PFMEA works, how the control plan works, because really those are a little bit synonymous uh, when it comes to the submission level here, okay? Um, as we enter information for um, a characteristic, so I'll just pick a characteristic here. Um, in our uh, little detailed information over on the side over here, we can select the gauge category right here that we want to use um, as we measure this part, right? So we're in the planning phase, the top part of the wheel that you saw before. And here we can identify how we want to measure this later on. Um, now this, for those that are, are paying attention very closely, this is part of the control plan as well as the measurement technique. So as we identify how we want it measured here, this information will be automatically transferred to the control plan later on. Similarly, if this was a, a designator by chance, uh, maybe it's a, a CTQ or a critical or key characteristic, something like that. And if we change this, wanted to point this out only to, to um, uh, show you the different rules in the system that are possible. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, we have down here in our bill of characteristics that shows the gauge category. Uh, and we I just changed this to the designator, but I also have a rule in my system that says to update the sampling plan to be based on an AQL table instead of you know, what it was originally. So you can have different rules in the system to help streamline your process, but also to help, um, well, it, it's gonna make it more efficient. That's absolutely true. However, it's also gonna make it more accurate because as you're changing things, some other actions are being done automatically instead of having to go back and say, oh, did I do this? Did I check this? Did, did I have to double check and make sure that this is the correct way? So you can change things based on rules. Um, for, for example, another example of that is uh, if it was, oh gosh, I don't know, if it was a radius, here you go. So if this is a rate for all radial callouts, so here you can see the type right down here, maybe we can set up a rule in the system that says for all radial callouts, automatically make my gauge category a radius gauge or something like that. You can absolutely set up those rules in the system so that once it is um, ballooned, 
it would actually see that this is a radial dimension and automatically apply that. So it's a matter of efficiency and um, streamlining it. But how does this translate to the PFMEA? Uh, I mentioned this because as we're building our information down here, it affects our what we call manufacturing operations. So our manufacturing operations um, can break this information down into um, different uh, categories, right? So it, let me, uh, actually, I can just delete one here and um, show you how we can add one. I'll show you how we can add that in just a minute. Um, but as we break this down into operations or, hey, this is my milling operation, for example, and here's my dimensions affected by my milling operation. And you can have as many operations as you want. And if you would like, you can even change uh, the information for these operations because maybe it's an in-process check and maybe the, the nominal value is different. Maybe you need to add information or subtract it or go by a, a percentage. Maybe it's a plating operation. So you can change this information for this operation. You can even change sampling modes to be based on, uh, or excuse me, change sampling modes for this operation different from the finished part that you see right up here. So you can do all of those um, or capture all that information in the different operations. However, where it relates to the PFMEA is the operation that we identify here will also be identified by the process used for that operation. So the PFMEA, as you well know, is of uh, failure modes for a certain process, different than the DFMEA, which is for the design of the part. Um, so as, uh, or how we work this, is that as we're identifying the dimensions that are used in this operation, we also at the same time can select the process used for this operation. So when that happens, all the information that is tied to this process will be automatically populated in the uh, PFMEA. Okay, let me show you a little bit of how that works. So if we go over to our PFMEA, so here in our PQP, so um, just to give you a quick little background on this, and we're trying to focus mainly on the PFMEA on this, in this um, uh, webinar, but just to give you a very quick overview, um, our, in our PQP, this is our full submission package, right? So all the components here are what we call an index, and you can have different indices that have different um, submission information in them. What do I mean by that? Just very, very briefly, maybe for a brand new part that needs to be sent in, maybe you need these um, uh, submission requirements and they all need to be submitted. Sure, no problem. Maybe for a repeat part, you only need to submit these few things, but you still need to retain other information. Absolutely. So you can have as many indices as you, uh, as you need or as you'd like. And also keep in mind, we have a level of uh, configurability that's fairly unique in the system, in, in, in the industry. And what, what I mean by that is a lot of our, a lot of other systems out there say, yes, I, uh, here's an FAI, use this one. Here's a uh, gauge R&R template, use this one. Here's a uh, SBC report, use this one. Um, ours is, what do you want it to be? For example, maybe you have a, a customer A that says, I want you to use my um, FAI template for the submissions that you sent to me. Okay, you could create their template in their index so that whenever you go and select their index, it would automatically put in their customized form. So again, you can have as many as you want here and configure them however you would like to. But let's talk about the PFMEA because that's why we're here. So we selected all of the information, or excuse me, we selected the process in the manufacturing operation when we identified the operation. Now, all the information for the, um, all the failure modes for those operations was automatically brought in into the um, uh, PFMEA as you see it here, okay? So now it came from what we call a library. I'm gonna show you where that library is in just a minute. 
Um, but now that this PFMEA has been brought in, um, you can change it. Think of it as like starting with a template and then uniquely uh, making it configured for this specific part or part number, right? So, hey, this isn't a, a, a seven for this, for example, maybe this is a four, you know, for this specific part. Okay, great, now it's a four. Um, everything is automatically calculated and updated, okay? So all of that is captured in the system. And um, so actually, let, let's talk about <laughs> that for just a second. I'll show you where that library is in just a second. But something else we wanna talk about is permissions because I just changed something on the PFMEA, right? Well, I have to have a access to even see this in the first place, right? So we have user roles in the system that only certain people are allowed in here. But even as they're in here, um, once they um, change something in here, all the changes need to go through what we call a workflow. Maybe to show this, I can also um, show you what the uh, control plan looks like. So the control plan, was automatically updated and generated from the information that was in the bill of characteristics and the process that was identified in the manufacturing operation, right? So it grabbed all of this information. By the way, nothing you see here and nothing in the PFMEA was typed in. All of this was synchronized and brought over from information that was already available in the bill of characteristics. OK, because here's the sampling rate. Correct. So that came from the sampling plan that we identified. Um, here's the uh, measurement technique, which is the gauge category that was synchronized. And then, of course, this information was captured when we blew in the print. So all that information is done. But if you want, need to change anything here, everything I mentioned, a workflow. So everything goes through a workflow all the approval levels. So it's going to draft in. This is blue because it starts at this level. So we're, or excuse me, it's currently at this level. So it's in the draft stage. And then when it's done here, it would be submitted by whomever's changing it. And then it would go for a sign off. Now this workflow is completely configurable. You can have it be whatever you want it to be. And you can actually have as many workflows as you would like. OK, so maybe you want to have a different workflow for the control plan as for the PFMEA as for the process flow. You can if you'd like to. Um, or maybe you'd like it to go from a draft to uh, the quality manager for an approval, not necessarily signature, but just approval. Sure. And then maybe it goes to the operations manager for a sign off and maybe it goes to the customer even for a, a sign off from them. You can have it go internal inside your, your network, or you can even have it go external to a customer, um, an external customer, or a supplier, something along those lines. So everything that we do, I mentioned before, is all done digitally. And then we also track it as well. So everything you see here is done digitally. We have a signature step here. If that were to be completed, we could go up into signatures here, and the signature would be populated right here. And you would see the signature, uh, the IP address, who the signature itself, um, a time, date stamp, all that information. Everything that's done here is tracked in a history. This, what, this is what was done. This is who did it. Um, all of this information. So from a traceability standpoint, this, is, was done, this was done. This is who did it. This is even minor records to see who opened this. Like this is just now me opening this. Um, this information is captured in here. But let's get back to the PFMEA because that's why everybody's here, right? So this PFMEA was populated from information from the library, okay? So let's go check out the library. As we go up into manufacturing up here, we can see that we have a process library right here, okay? So we'll go, um, we'll click into this process library. So what happens is this is a listing of processes that are identified for your organization, right? So this would be unique to you. Or if you're a plastic injection molding place, you wouldn't have a casting operation, right? <laughs> or a casting process. Um, but here's all the information so that when it's selected, here is the, um, uh, the library that it's pulling from. For example, when we pulled in a milling operation in the process flow, which we didn't even see yet, it pulled in a fabrication um, uh, stage. Why? Because that's what is listed here, 
whatever's listed here is what it's going to bring in. For our template FMEA, here is the um, like core template information that was pulled in when we selected that milling process in the milling operation. So all we have to do is select that milling operation and then this information is automatically generated, or excuse me, automatically transferred down to the PFMEA. So, but let's say you have a, like a continuous improvement event and you need to change the template itself, not a problem. You can come up here and say, oh, this, we, we had a continuous improvement. This isn't a five, this is really a three now. Okay, great, now it's a three. That's been updated. Now, every new time that you select this milling process in a milling operation, um, it will bring in this new information, all right? So, and by the way, from a, a, a traceability standpoint, you have to have access, special access to get to the, the library in order to make those changes, right? We can't just have anybody going in and making these changes. So know that that's um, controlled as well. And even you can look in the FMEA templates. So here's an overall of all of the processes and all of the um, failure modes for all of the processes that you can identify and see right in this um, area right here. Okay. So uh, let's see. Oh, we're starting to run low on time. That was quick. Holy cow. Um, let me show you just one other thing very quickly because it relates to it. Okay. Um, that's why I'm showing it to you. So if we go into PQP records, uh, we went into the uh, control plan and the PFMEA do want to mention the process flow because the process flow is also synchronized with the manufacturing operations. We can see right here, it says sync processes. So what happens is as we change things and add these processes, just popping over here again, very quickly. So as we add these processes to the operations, what happens is um, the uh, process flow is like the starting point, by the way. Um, we say sync processes, it goes back to the manufacturing operations and brings in all of those processes. But we also have uh, information in here in processes that are not manufacturing related, right? Ordering material, shipping parts, things like that. So we can add processes that are inside, you see non-manufacturing and manufacturing that are inside and outside of manufacturing. So the process flow is kind of like the starting point, if you will. And you can even tweak things in here. Like for example, we, we deleted this out of here. Even if I say delete and I wanna delete this out of here. Okay, great, now that's deleted. And again, we're real time in the database, right? So everything is um, log tracked and traced at the same time. So even if I go back to my index and go to my, uh, back to my PFMEA, since I deleted it out of my process flow, it gives me a message that says, hey, your process flow has changed, you need to synchronize. And we have to synchronize our processes. And now it shows me by red that these have been removed. Do you want to remove them from your PFMEA? And if it was added, it would show up as green to say, hey, this has been added, do you want to add those? Then we hit apply changes, we confirm yes. And now our PFMEA has been updated. Okay, didn't type anything, didn't have to right click anything else. It all, um, it all is synchronized now to the process flow, which is synchronized to the manufacturing operations, <laughs> which is synchronized ultimately to the drawing and to the bill of characteristics um, that was identified, that, were, that we used to identify um, different uh, unique characteristics of the uh, dimensions themselves. So that's how we automatically generate a PFMEA. There's actually more information to it. Um, I thought I would get to it, but I didn't quite have time to it. We're at our time at 1130. Tried to keep these quick and short for you. Um, are there any questions? Lisa, did any questions come in? So yes, we actually did have a couple of questions come in. Um, okay. And we're getting a few more right now. So let's take a look. Um, the first question asks, is this a standalone system? So this works inside of, uh, of inspection manager. Um, so it would be, it's, let's call it, it's an application. It is a separate application, but it runs inside of inspection manager. So you'd have to get inspection manager and then um, get a lot of the information in it, meaning for the database, get that all set up. 
Um, ideally, if you do want to go this route, it would be best to, to get them together uh, because we can actually onboard you with the PQP information and all the PFMEA information right out of the gate. Um, so you're not having to add it later. But yeah, it is a separate application, but it runs inside of Inspection Manager. Okay, great. Here is another question. This one's a little bit in depth. Sure. Uh, it says, during many of our fabrication processes, a risk is, exists on damages due to hoisting or other handling. How would you manage these generic handling risks? And then there's a part two. Um, okay, so that's a good question. So how do we manage the risks? It's a little bit of a different concept because there's there's some PFMEA um, software out there that uh, that does that, right? It kind of, hey, how do I control the risk? How can I mitigate this? How can I alleviate this? And all that good stuff. What we're in the process of doing is generating the documentation on the backside. So we actually wouldn't help with the like mitigating risk and how does that work? You would have to um, change the risk level, whether by the maybe the severity changes, something along those lines. And then you can um, change it in the template, notate why it changed, how it changed. So that would be logged in the database. Um, and then for all new times going forward, um, those risks adjusted severities would be automatically generated on your uh, PFMEA. I hope that answers your question okay. And there's a second part you said? Yeah, so it says um, separately as a generic risk, or can I, for example, add it as a module that is included in the fabrication FMEA? If so, how to maintain these generic risk, risks centrally? Um, well, you can change. Let me, I'm trying to get out of here. Okay. Do, do, do. Hide that. Okay, so in the PFME, that would be a little bit more along the lines of in the, oops, wrong spot, sorry about that. So in the library itself, um, you can uh, change things. And as you change here, you can also add notes as to that risk mitigation. I guess uh, maybe we could talk offline about exactly what you're looking for because I'm having a problem kind of, kind of relating it back. Um, you can add uh, um, any failure mode you want in here. Um, and um, assign it a certain way and also track it a certain way. So if you needed to uh, um, like relate it back to a risk mitigation um, event that you had, uh, we can do that, but it, it's not gonna be synchronized to like a risk mitigation um, uh, process that you use. Okay, well, we'll conclude with this final question as we are past our time. Um, these sessions are intended to be brief um, and hyper-focused on one specific functionality within the software. Um, we do have additional postings on our website of, of various webinar recordings. Feel free to check those out. You can always email us, um, call us with additional questions at any time. We also are, of course, are happy to show you a one-on-one -on -one demonstration and, and dive deeper into any of this. So feel free to reach out. Um, but anyways, this final question says, how long does it take to get trained on this? Um, it, it a little bit depends on it. Not as bad as you think it is really, because we give you a lot of the templates and the information for it, and then you have to tweak it for your, um, for your company. Um, and I, I apologize. I have to kind of generically um, answer this question. Um, it's really as fast as you want to go. Um, our professional services team is equipped to kind of go at your speed. If you need to do this hyper fast. We actually have a customer right now who's onboarding um, extremely fast because he's got a submission. He's got to <laughs> get done very quickly. Um, and literally you're talking a couple of weeks um, or less. Um, however, if you're you know, a larger organization, you need to unpack this or roll this out. Or if maybe you're, you're a large company and you're looking at this from your supplier standpoint, it would be a matter of, do you have someone dedicated to this? Is this something you're kind of doing on the side? How many um, processes do you have? Uh, generically speaking, probably anywhere from four weeks to four to eight weeks, uh, generally in order to get everything um, processed properly. But it's really, uh, we go at your speed and as fast as you want to go. 
Perfect. Makes sense. Okay. Well, great. Thank you so much, Tim, for sharing your expertise. Uh, Tim is also posting our contact information on the screen as we speak. So again, as I mentioned, feel free to reach out. We are recording this session and I will be sending this out via email in the next few days uh, so you can watch the playback. Thanks so much, everyone, for spending the half hour with us. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks.